I've reached my limit. I'm going back to my parents' house. Those were the words I exclaimed in the spring after seven years of marriage. My husband, John, carelessly tossed aside the newspaper he was reading and said with a look of disdain. To give up over something so trivial. You really don't understand the role of a wife. He then stood up, knocking his chair over in the process, and declared. We're getting a divorce. Here's no point in supporting you. There are plenty of others who could take your place. Standing tall before me, arms crossed, unaware of the unbelievable ordeal that was about to unfold. My name is Susan, a 28-year-old housewife. Our saga began seven years ago when I was deceived into moving in with John's family. Unbeknownst to me, he hadn't mentioned the critical care his grandfather required or the fact that his brother, Brandon, was a recluse. John's family ran a modest but historic local construction company with about 40 employees. His father, Robert, was the president, his mother, Barbara, the executive director, and John himself held the position of managing director. Despite its size, the company was well regarded in the area. They all worked from the home office, which was situated on the same property as their residence. I had initially thought about renting an apartment nearby, but John insisted. We often discuss work at home with my father, and there's no need to go through the hassle of renting an apartment. It's been this way for generations in our family. So, at 21, I naively agreed, thinking it was the norm. Our relationship started when his grandmother, Margaret, who was receiving rehabilitation at the center where I worked, fell and fractured her leg. Despite my inexperience and frequent mistakes, she never scolded me but instead encouraged me with a gentle. Keep up the good work. She was a beacon of kindness amidst my days filled with scoldings from patients and seniors. It was John, her grandson, who drove her to and from the center. I assumed that he must be as kind as her, which made me readily accept his invitation to dinner when Margaret was about to complete her rehabilitation. As we started dating, I noticed a roughness in John's manner, but I mistook it for the assertiveness needed in a self-employed individual. I believed that his grandmother's kindness must be inherent in him as well. With such thoughts clouding my judgment, when he proposed after less than a year of dating, I said yes, partly due to my strong desire to marry and partly to fulfill my aging parents' wish to see their grandchildren. Upon our visit to his family home, Robert, the archetypal construction company president, joyfully exclaimed. We've got a great daughter-in-law now. Well done, John. While Barbara warmly welcomed me, saying. We've never had a daughter, so this is a joy for us. Margaret, active and bustling, with a beaming smile, served us food, saying. We're blessed to have such a reliable person join our family. Reflecting back, I wonder why I didn't realize that only Grandma Margaret was tirelessly working around the house. When we started living together, the first shock was not just the presence of my bedridden grandfather George, but also the discovery of Brandon, my brother-in-law, who kept to his room all the time. And then there was my mother-in-law, Barbara, who did absolutely nothing. She's listed as the vice president of the company, so she would leave for the office with my father-in-law, Robert, and my husband, John, but her version of a work was far from what you'd expect. She would casually say, Susan, could you help out a little? And while I was left to clean the office or assist with clerical work, she would be chatting away with young male employees or gossiping with her friends from the neighborhood, not doing any real work. All the house chores and the care of my grandfather fell on the shoulders of 74-year-old Grandma Margaret. The only thing Barbara seemed to do was to take the meals Margaret prepared to Brandon's room. She'd enter his room with a cooing. Brandon, how are you feeling? I had such a good day today. She'd speak to him in a tone you'd use with a lover and then stay there for a while. Brandon, my 17-year-old brother-in-law, had turned into a recluse after entering high school, or so John tells me. When I expressed my wish to John that I should have been informed earlier, he just shrugged it off, saying. He'll come out soon enough. And so, along with Grandma Margaret, I found myself juggling housework, caring for my grandfather, looking after Brandon, and handling office tasks like clerical work and cleaning. I felt like a hamster on a wheel, constantly working. Before we got married, I had made it clear to John that I wanted to continue my career as a physical therapist, and he had agreed. However, to my shock, he had unilaterally submitted my resignation to the rehab center. Both John and Barbara acted as if nothing had happened, saying things like, 
Come on, we're going to the office. And? You need to learn the ropes of our family business quickly. They expected me to accept my role without question, making it impossible for me to even think about returning to the rehab center. Despite feeling betrayed and confused, my only solace was Grandma Margaret. I've always had a soft spot for grandmothers, and being able to help Margaret, who despite her age, managed the household, became my source of joy and purpose. Barbara treated her mother-in-law with disdain, frequently snapping at her with remarks like, The tea is lukewarm, Margaret. There's still dirt on this plate, look properly. And my father-in-law, Robert, wasn't any better, often making derogatory comments like, Honestly, mother is so clumsy. Household chores are all she's good for. Even John, whether it's a long-standing habit or just indifference, never stood up for his grandmother, letting the insults pass as if they were the most natural thing in the world. I felt so sorry for my great-grandmother-in-law, a fragile beacon of resilience in our bustling household, that I did everything I could to help without getting scolded. I took on chores and caregiving with a fervent dedication. Whenever I finished a task or lent a helping hand, she would always, with a twinkle in her eye and a gentle smile, say, Thank you, dear. That acknowledgement, simple yet profound, warmed my heart amidst the chaos of our daily life. Preparing meals was a Herculean task in itself. I had to consider the nutritional needs of my bedridden great-grandfather-in-law, the picky eating habits of my brother-in-law Brandon, and the specific tastes of my in-laws in their fifties. My husband John, adding to the complexity, would often childishly whine. Grandma, make something more energizing. His words would echo through the kitchen, adding a layer of frustration to the already demanding task. Our sprawling seven-bedroom home, with its vast garden, demanded constant attention and care. Cleaning and maintaining it felt like an endless marathon. The work clothes of my father-in-law Robert and John were particularly troublesome, often requiring handwashing due to stubborn stains, adding to the physical toll of my daily duties. Yet, as the matriarch, my great-grandmother-in-law Margaret oversaw everything, allowing me to work as her assistant rather than bearing the full brunt of the responsibilities. Despite this, the sheer volume of work made my days dizzyingly busy. I often envied the leisurely weekends my in-laws enjoyed, as they seemed to escape the domestic battlefield with ease. Both my great-grandfather-in-law George and Robert, owing to their old family lineage, were immensely particular about appearances. A neglected garden or a dirty window could lead to severe reprimands. Their constant refrain, a daughter-in-law should do better, became a haunting echo in my mind, a reminder of the expectations weighing heavily on my shoulders. In contrast, Barbara, my mother-in-law, seemed to navigate these family dynamics with a grace that made her immune to criticism. I couldn't help but feel the world was unjust, seeing her avoid the scolding that so frequently came my way. John, always citing social obligations, would frequently leave for surfing or baseball, his absence leaving a void that I, along with Margaret, strive to fill. Together, we were a team, tirelessly moving through the 365-day cycle of household management and caregiving. Despite the overwhelming nature of our duties, there was a bittersweet comfort in those times. Margaret and I grew incredibly close, united in our shared struggle. We managed the household chores and caregiving with a symbiotic rhythm, ensuring the home remained a clean and welcoming haven. Margaret was the epitome of kindness and understanding. Whenever I made a mistake, she would graciously take the blame, saying, It was my oversight, I'm sorry, dear. Her ability to shield me from criticism with a simple apology and a knowing wink was a testament to her strength and love. However, tragedy struck a year after I joined the household when Margaret suffered a stroke and became in need of care herself. Suddenly, the responsibility of the entire household fell squarely on my shoulders. I found myself the target of reprimands and anger that Margaret had once deflected. Robert and George, impatient with my learning curve, would chastise me for my slowness, reminding me of my dependence on them. The workload, once shared between two, became mine alone, along with the added burden of Margaret's care. The weight of these responsibilities was suffocating, leaving me with barely a moment to rest. The tasks that Margaret and I used to manage together now seemed like mountains I had to climb alone. Even as I suffered, my mother-in-law, Barbara, turned a blind eye, persistently burdening me with her company's tasks, never lifting a finger to help with the household chores. And doting exclusively on my brother-in-law, Brandon. 
One day, after she returned from Brandon's room, she lashed out at me, saying, Come on, Brandon's meal. He scolded me because there were carrots in it. Get it together, please. I bit my tongue, desperately wanting to retort that she should take care of it herself. Then, one day, perhaps displeased with my cooking, Brandon refused to eat anything I prepared. Concerned, I knocked on his door, and to my surprise, he emerged. His hair was a mess, his skin was worn from lack of sunlight, and his eyes were vacant. He didn't look 18 at all. He immediately said to me, I want to get out of here, find a job, I've heard your kind. He knew I was a physical therapist, working in caregiving, and had even talked with my grandmother-in-law, Margaret, to understand my character better. Since then, I've been advising him, suggesting he might consider becoming a caregiver himself. With government aid available for caregiving schools and generally kind-hearted peers, I believed they would welcome him. He decided to start through a correspondence course, having already graduated from an equivalent high school. However, when Barbara overheard this, she berated me, saying, What have you told Brandon? Caregiving is such a lowly job. Don't encourage him to do that. He's going to college and will work for our family business. I was stunned by her disdain for caregivers, and it dawned on me that her refusal to care for her own parents was rooted in this contempt. After that, years went by without any conversations with Brandon. Six years, to be precise. The only thing that kept me going through this hellish existence was Margaret, but this year, before spring could arrive, she passed away. Drowned in grief, I received no comfort from my husband, John, or my in-laws. Barbara, in her usual manner, rushed me. Stop moping around. Clear out the old lady's things, will you? Overwhelmed by loss and devoid of motivation, the house quickly fell into disarray, and I neglected both the chores and caring for my grandfather-in-law, George. This neglect led to an outburst from John one morning. Hey, you're living off us, and you can't even do the housework or caregiving. Something inside me snapped at that moment, and before I knew it, I was standing up, yelling. I've reached my limit. I'm going back to my parents' house. John, dropping his newspaper roughly, retorted. Giving up so easily. You truly don't understand what it means to be a good wife. He then stood up, overturning his chair, and declared. It's divorce then. No point in supporting you. There are plenty of others who can replace you. Barbara, overhearing this, agreed with a smirk. She's never provided an heir anyway, so why not? Realizing Barbara's true sentiments, I felt a wave of despair and, wanting to never see their faces again, I signed the divorce papers and left my in-laws home. My parents welcomed me back warmly, assuring me that at my young age, brighter days were ahead. I shed tears I had held back for seven years in front of them, resolved to forge my own path. After a brief rest, I found a job at a nearby caregiving facility, determined to start anew. It hadn't been two weeks when I got a call from my former mother-in-law, Barbara. Her voice, laden with despair, pleaded through the line. Susan, please, come back home. I couldn't help but marvel at her audacity to call after all that had happened, responding coldly. I'm at work right now, can I hang up if it's not urgent? Her plea intensified. Wait, please. It's Brandon. He's out of control and I can't handle him. Come home now. Then Brandon himself snatched the phone, his voice seething with frustration. Susan, I'm fed up with them too. Don't bother coming back here. And with that, he abruptly ended the call. I had a good idea of the chaos unfolding, but wanting to maintain my professionalism at my new job, I decided to forget the call for the time being. That evening, my ex-husband John chimed in. His tone, unjustifiably arrogant, declared. You know... I'm willing to forgive you now. You can come back. It baffled me how he could be so presumptuous. Excuse me? Forgive me? What exactly did I do? His response was patronizing. You complained about being at your wit's end, despite being taken care of. Maybe I should have listened to your complaints occasionally. His audacity left me speechless. I firmly replied. Well, thanks, but I've no intention of returning. Please take care. As I tried to end the call, he desperately retorted. Wait. How do you plan to survive? You don't have a job. Unfazed, I informed him. 
You seem to forget, I'm a sought-after physical therapist. Don't worry about me. His calls persisted, his voice laced with false magnanimity. Just come back. Don't be stubborn. But my patience had worn thin. Enough. I'm done with your incessant nagging. I could hear his shocked gulp through the phone. In a final outburst, I vented all my pent-up frustrations. Who would return to such a house? You've belittled and exploited me enough. Be grateful I haven't sued you. With that, I ended the call and blocked him. Surprisingly, I felt a wave of relief wash over me, almost regretting not standing up for myself sooner. Six months later, at the nursing facility where I worked, I spotted Brandon joining as a part-time staff member. Surprised, I waved at him. His cheeks flushed with a healthy glow, he approached, sheepishly smiling. It's been a while, he said. After leaving that house, he started living on his own. The state of the home after my departure was reportedly dismal. Firstly, with no one to care for the great-grandfather, a constant foul smell permeated the house, and he, frustrated by the lack of decent meals, would yell daily. The mother-in-law tried hiring helpers, but none could handle the great-grandfather's difficult ways, and they quickly resigned. Despite her efforts, the mother-in-law's unfamiliarity with caregiving only led to more shouting and frustration. Are you even a wife? Was the great-grandfather's go-to reprimand. Brandon, for his part, initially unaware of my departure, became infuriated with the inadequate meals brought by his mother, exclaiming. How can anyone eat this? His frustration continued for days until he learned of my leaving and exploded, blaming his family for driving me away. He lost his temper and said. It's because of you guys bullying her. Who the hell do you think you are? This call from the former mother-in-law was likely about that. Brandon, sensitive by nature, had always detested his parents and brother for their treatment of his grandmother. Feeling alienated during adolescence and struggling to fit in at school, he became reclusive. Meeting me, he was inspired to venture outside, but his aspirations were crushed when his mother vehemently dismissed his caregiving job. However, hearing of my own departure, he resolved to leave as well. He mentioned the former father-in-law's company floundering after my exit, with employees resigning upon hearing of my unfair dismissal and business partners withdrawing, leading to its inevitable collapse. Recently, the company went bankrupt, and the family house was seized for debt, leaving them homeless. My leaving was merely the catalyst for an already unstable situation. Once, the former in-laws and husband visited my family's home, begging for reconciliation and even prostrating themselves. But my parents, having heard of my seven years of suffering, staunchly refused to let them in. After my divorce, my parents heard about my seven years of hardship for the first time, and they seemed to regret not realizing it sooner. My father, unyielding, threatened to call the police, reinforcing my disconnection from them. Thankfully, they never returned. Meanwhile, Brandon, working in a care facility, turned out to be diligent and caring, often sneaking out to talk to his grandmother, who he resembled. One day, he expressed his gratitude to me for caring for her, tearfully conveying her appreciation for my kindness in her challenging life. Thank you so much for taking care of my grandmother all this time. I think my grandmother had a tough life, but being treated kindly and cherished by you in the end made all her efforts worthwhile, she said. She was really glad you became part of our family. She truly hope you find happiness. This moved me deeply, affirming my path as a physical therapist. Remembering her kind presence, both of us couldn't stop our tears. Being present at the end of someone's life can be tough and sorrowful, but I realized that it can also lead to encountering such beautiful emotions. Despite the hardships, the former family, now in a dilapidated apartment, struggles with debt, work, and caregiving. The former father-in-law, working as a night security guard despite his age, and the mother-in-law, failing to hold down a job, face constant beratement from her great-grandfather. When she is at home, her great-grandfather scolds her violently. You are truly a useless wife who can't do anything. So, it seemed like she is living a miserable life, changing jobs frequently. My ex-husband, he seems like he is making a living by doing day labor job, leads a miserable existence, often drunk and quarrelsome. Brandon is glad to have left, focusing on his studies to become a care worker. 
Inspired by him, I also pursued this path, and years later, we would jointly establish a new care facility, but that's a story for another time.